Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'm so honored to invite the beautiful and smart and talented Dr. Amena Van Dyken. How are you? I am wonderful. Thanks for having me, Lori. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Armena and I met when I was in Hawaii speaking, and what a delight, you and your husband, and I can't wait to share your story. So can you tell us a little bit just about you, maybe why you went to medicine and how you went to a plant-based diet, just kind of your background? Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, so I have wanted to be a doctor since I was about four years old. So, like, as soon as I knew what a doctor was, I wanted to be one. So my whole life has been dedicated to that. I, uh, um, I grew up eating everything. When I turned six years old or so, I started to realize what I was eating. And um, by the time I was nine, I had become an ethical vegetarian all by myself. So <laughs> it all came from a piece of chicken that I was eating when I was young and I put it together and realized what I was eating. And um, I stopped from that. However, I still loved my cheese, my eggs, uh, all the dairy, everything but milk I seemed to love. So I kept that up um, through high school, through college, through medical school. And then um, 2010, actually, my husband and I, my husband Russell, who's a huge support structure in my life, um, we decided we wanted to go vegan, essentially. And it was kind of almost by accident. It was pretty funny. Um, I was doing my medical training in North Dakota, and it's very cold there. And it's um, the diet there is not what I would describe as healthy, typically. So unhealthy diet, I packed on a few extra pounds. I was in training, and my husband and I decided, you know what? We're going to Hawaii for vacation. We're going to Maui. We want to look good. I wanted to look good in my bathing suit. Let's lose some weight. So we looked out, see what was out there. Luckily, Joel Furman had a new book out, which I actually started to read and figure out that, hey, maybe just eating plants will do it. And so cut out the eggs, cut out the dairy, and um, of course the weight came off. And it wasn't that much overweight, right? But it was enough for me to really want to um, lose it. So anyways, um, we, we never look back. We've been doing wonderful and we're, we're feeling great, happy with it. Um, I do want to say though, it wasn't like a gradual switch. It wasn't an all or nothing type of from one day to the next where we just went to eating no animal products. Um, it was really, really gradual. And me, I'm Dutch. So I love my cheese, right? That mm -hmm. was my thing. And in training, I was an intern in surgery at the time. And it was like, every morning I had to have my bagel toasted with egg and cheese on it. That's what I had to have to make it through the day. And um, being able to give that up, that was hard. Mm. But I do know when I really transitioned was about six months, six months later, it was my birthday. And my husband, Russell was like, oh, I know what I'm gonna do to make her happy. He bought me a piece of aged cheese. It was this beautiful like Dutch aged cheese, right? That he gave me, special ordered it, all this stuff. I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, this is a treat. I put it in the fridge. Well, that cheese rotted in the fridge. I never ate it. And that's when I knew I was like, okay, well, I guess I don't need cheese anymore. <laughs> so I'd made that transition by then, but it did take about six months or so. Mm, nice. Yeah. And then was Russell already vegetarian vegan when you guys met? No, when we met, Russell ate everything. He mm -hmm. absolutely loved meat. I, he actually said to me once, he said, before you die, I will have you eating hamburgers. And uh, <laughs> I guess I might be a little more stubborn than him. But um, yeah, we kind of went on the bandwagon together. So honestly, for him, it was a much larger change. He went from being an omnivore to completely vegan, plant-based, whereas I kind of went from vegetarian to vegan. It's not such a huge shift. Right, absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit more about the medical training, because you're a general surgeon, which is insane, um, in training and then your schedule. I mean, so... Tell us a little bit about living in Hawaii and being a general surgeon. For sure. Yeah. So I chose general surgery. Um, and it's interesting when I look back on it. I chose general surgery, first off, because I like procedures. I like to do things with my hands. Um, second off, I thought it was so rewarding. I just loved um, being able to make such a quick difference in somebody's life, you know, and that to me was huge. And I think going through medical school and you can probably identify, Lori, you know, you're, you're handing out medicines to people kind of managing these chronic diseases and the reward level of that to me at least was really low. So mm -hmm. naturally I gravitated towards something that was higher reward, I think. 
Right. Um, but that being said, totally shifting, not answering your question, but lifestyle medicine, working with lifestyle changes where you see huge rewards, it's kind of the same thing. It's very encouraging. And it's something that is, you know, I think that's why lifestyle medicine is appealing to me as well. Right. But um, yeah, I love general surgery. I still do it. I practice it full time here in Hawaii. We, my husband and I, we moved to Hawaii because we really wanted to be here. So Russell nice. spent a lot of his life growing up on Maui. Um, his grandparents lived here and he just, he loves the island. And when we first got serious, he said, oh, well, I'm going to take you to Hawaii. You just have to go. You're going to love it. And I remember saying, oh, Hawaii is overrated. It's not a big deal. And <laughs> we went one time and I fell in love. This place is amazing. If any of you guys have not been to Maui or Hawaii in general, come visit. It's beautiful. Right. So absolutely. It's, it's lovely and where you live is beautiful too, because you're building your own home. Well, yeah. Russ is building the home. Yeah. I'm sure you're helping when <laughs> exactly. you can, but um, it's a pretty incredible view. And what you guys are doing is, is pretty amazing. And just your story of that alone is absolutely definitely. incredible. Can you tell us a little bit about your living situation? Yeah. And <laughs> I definitely can. I can't, so, I can't describe it. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, it's kind of expensive to live in Hawaii. That's the downside. And so we really wanted some space. So we invested in a beautiful piece of property, two acres. It's lovely. But the problem is, is um, there's no house on it. So we are building a house, which we love. It's fun. It's a creative project. But while we're building the house in order to not have to pay rent in a separate place while we're, you know, paying to build a house, we are living on the property. Um, I like to call it glamping but um, we're living in just a beautiful canvas tent. So picture like a festival tent, a big, huge, um, <laughs> it's over 200 square feet. So it's like tiny home style, you know, right. uh, tent. And it started out as just this little tent. And then eventually we realized we can't stay in the tent. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's too small. So we built a separate little platform where we have a second tent. That's kind of our living area. So we have a bedroom tent. We have a cooking tent and living area tent. We have a full kitchen in that tent. We've got, um, you know, television, refrigerator, dishwasher. We got all of that. The internet. Um, Do you have internet? We don't actually. Oh. We just use our oh. cellular phones for a gotcha. little bit there, but that's the big challenge. Internet will be a big win. <laughs> um, but we also have every luxury you can imagine we have a hot shower that's outdoors it's so luxurious actually to shower outdoors it's fun wow. um, we have a toilet with a bidet it's all composting so we've been learning how to compost we have a huge garden that we are growing delicious fruits and vegetables on we're, mm -hmm. we're doing all of that so it's definitely yeah. an alternative lifestyle and we love it well, the house is really coming along and shouldn't take more than, I think, rest at a year or so left. Yeah. So actually yesterday, he's like, maybe we'll be done in about eight months. So oh, I'm getting really optimistic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful property. Absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, then as far as tell us, how did you to start marrying or marrying lifestyle medicine with being a general surgeon? I mean, I get it with a family practice doc, but how did you, or how do you incorporate that into your practice? Definitely. Um, I try to incorporate it almost with every patient I see. So mm -hmm. I gave a, uh, a lecture, gosh, it must be about five years ago now. Um, it's titled 10 ways a plant-based diet will help you avoid the scalpel. And the thing mm -hmm. is, is, being a, a general surgeon, I'm just seeing how many surgical conditions are caused by um, lifestyle issues, poor lifestyle choices, whether it's, you know, poor dietary choices and you're dealing with diabetes and the complications of that, which can be a huge problem and an issue, um, or whether we're dealing with obesity. Um, I, I'm sure you are aware, but many of your listeners not, that when you are obese, your risk of complications from any surgery, even a minor surgery, goes up big time. Mm -hmm. You're on the operating room table longer, um, your recovery is slower, there's, there's just so many issues with that. Mm. So um, it's almost every patient that I saw, I, I would see a link between lifestyle, uh, poor lifestyle choices and what's happening. And that's not to say every surgical condition and every single thing I do, it's um, a poor lifestyle choice. Yes, some things are genetic, some things you get no matter what, even though you're doing everything right. But 
um, the majority of it is definitely something that can be treated and reversed. So mm -hmm. for me, um, as a doctor, we all take the Hippocratic Oath, right? And the first thing is to first do no harm. And I felt like I was doing harm by not telling my patients um, about the power of lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. So every single thing I do, whether it's a general surgeon, we treat everything. So we treat everything from um, the mouth, the, the, all the way to the anus and the GI tract, right? So I deal with hemorrhoids, I deal, which is a lifestyle thing many times, right? Not enough fiber. We deal with diverticulitis, which is colon inflammation, which is also a product of poor diet. Um, and even things like breast cancer. Breast mm -hmm. cancer, the data is so strong. If you are mm -hmm. obese and you are a postmenopausal woman, your risk of breast cancer is way higher than mm -hmm. if you are of a normal weight. So um, really bringing all those factors in and you know, being a female breast surgeon, I do see quite a bit of breast cancer that I treat. Um, I'm able to actually help and hopefully steer patients in the right direction towards positive change when it comes to lowering risk of recurrence. Wow. And so can you tell us a little bit about the data linking nutrition and breast cancer? Yeah, so breast cancer, well, the biggest, the strongest data I would say is the link between obesity and breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. um, obesity, we do know just from inference in many studies that um, omnivores have the highest BMI or the high, mm -hmm. they're more obese on average, um, followed by vegetarians, followed by pescatarians, and then vegans. So vegans have the lowest um, obesity rates and BMI. So that's one thing that we have to remember. Uh, beyond that, there are very good studies that show that women who eat a minimum of five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, preferably you want seven, but five is the bare minimum, you're going to have a lower risk of cancer, right? And a higher overall health. Um, there was a study that was published last week, actually, in the British Medical Journal, and they were talking about um, not only cancer, but chronic disease survival. So they were talking about heart disease, diabetes, cancer. And what they did, they took a look at a huge cohort of women, and they showed that if you adopt four out of five major healthy lifestyle indicators, if you adopt four of those, first off, you live longer. So women lived an average of 11 years longer than those who did not adopt it. Um, and men was eight years, so not quite as long, but definitely longer. But what they did is they took that cohort of people and they actually looked at cancer rates. And they found that those people, and it's not just breast cancer, but cancer combined, those people actually lived 22 years longer than expected if they adopted four of these five lifestyle factors. And oh, the yeah. lifestyle factors, one of them is healthy diet, right? So, mm -hmm. and this was not totally a vegan diet in the study, but healthy diet defined by um, high fiber foods, right? Whole grains, not processed foods, whole foods, so fruits, vegetables, that type of thing. That's a healthy diet. The other factors, so maintaining a healthy BMI, not being overweight was a big factor, not smoking, exercise. You wanna make sure you get that exercise every day. And then moderate to no alcohol intake was another big factor. Mm -hmm. So um, adopting all of those things, is that's what lifestyle medicine is about. And that's how you can really make changes. Absolutely. So can you speak of any cases in particular that you found that were really interesting as far as someone switching a diet? Was there positive outcomes or anything? Um, I, I have anecdotal stories. Um, and then I'd have to tell you, while protecting the identity of my patients, I've had mm -hmm. a few of them that definitely did a 180. They came in with breast cancer. They completely restructured their lifestyle and they have seen um, well, in one case, I had to actually <laughs> argue with a particular patient to let me do surgery after she'd switched her entire lifestyle. Um, and we did the lumpectomy and there was no cancer in the area where the cancer was. So oh, I wow. do have some cases of that. Um, however, I, I don't have enough to say that, you know, this replaces surgery or anything like that. But um, I can tell you that we know the data is strong in regards to changing your lifestyle, changing what you eat, and breast cancer recurrence. Right. So you're, you're putting more odds in your favor by switching to a healthier Absolutely. diet and weight loss. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So as far as your coworkers, so you work mm -hmm. full time, and has there been any changes or conversions, or do they give you a hard time? Tell us a little bit about that. Actually, I don't get much of a hard time, which is good. 
Okay. Um, I, so I work in the Kaiser system, right? So okay. Kaiser is actually very um, outspoken about how healthy eating plants is the best thing that you can do is the best way you can eat. So my colleagues know that. But, I mean, every time we have a, um, an annual health day where essentially all of us, all the Kaiser providers in Hawaii, I mean, this is a big event in Honolulu, we all get together and we have a day conference meeting, right? Every single time it's stressed, the importance of eating plants, how that's the best for mm -hmm. us, for our patients. Um, the food is phenomenal because they give us really healthy food, right? Plant-based food, which is good. But um, so back to your question, yes, my colleagues know that that is the way that it needs to be. Um, I've also had the luxury of being able to lecture to my colleagues. So we've done these, we call them lunch and learns, and they're just, you know, lunch hour, we do a lecture about some topic related to nutrition. So lifestyle mm -hmm. medicine or diet or sleep is a good lecture, you know, so that type of stuff, it's really fun to be able to incorporate. Um, I have a lot of my colleagues, like uh, one of the primary care doctors the other day, messaged me and was like, you'd be so proud of me. I'm eating this out of my garden and, you know, like all of this really fun stuff. So, I mean, it's rewarding to see that. It's rewarding to be able to have chats with my cardiologists and just talk about, you know, things like coconut oil and how does that affect health? And it, it's, it's really fun to be able to do that. Awesome. So now you've also taken besides, it sounds like lectures in your professional career, but you and Russell have also a YouTube channel out of the doldrums. Can you tell us a little bit about what was the inspiration to start that and what kind of material can people find there? Totally. So out of the doldrums, um, Russell and I are huge sailors. So we named our channel after sailing. So out of the doldrums. Um, for those of you that don't know, the doldrums is like a uh, um, it's an area in the world that there's no airflow, there's no current, it's in the oceans, right? So back in the day when there were no motors and all the sailors sailed, they would get stuck in the doldrums. You always hear the term, oh, I'm stuck in the doldrums, and they would be stuck there for weeks before they'd be able to come out and um, sail across the world. So the doldrums are not a good thing. And um, we like the name of that channel because of the analogy that out of the doldrums means you're finally getting out of the doldrums, out of being stuck in a rut. You have a clear sense of direction. You've got wind at your back. You've got momentum and you're going. So that's why we chose that name, even though it's complicated and hard to remember. But um, <laughs> we love it. And anyways, our YouTube channel is fun. We um, have a whole variety of videos. So Russell and I do videos on our favorite vegan cookbooks, for example, or how to make a couple of recipes. Um, but I would say the majority of the channel is a lot of the research that I've done summarized on a certain topic. And then I give, it's like a mini lecture, you know, 10 minutes max mm -hmm. about a certain topic. And um, yeah, we try to add to it regularly. Awesome. And you, Lori, got to be a guest on there as well. I did. And we actually went hiking and you interviewed me on the hike, which is really cool and had all the cameras and everything. So it was pretty sweet. And so tell us now, because you mentioned recipes in your garden, can you tell us a little bit about in Hawaii, what type of fare you guys are eating regularly? Definitely. So in addition to our garden, Russell and I, we love to forage. So mm -hmm. we sometimes will spend a day on a weekend and go out into the, it's rainforest really, right? The jungle and pick fruits that are growing wild and um, we're so lucky here. We've got lilikoi, which is a passion fruit, which is really good. We've got um, pitaya, which is dragon fruit. We have something called ulu, which is the Hawaiian name for breadfruit. And I'll tell you, if you have never had breadfruit before, it's delicious. It is very delicious. Kind of like a, yeah, it's like a potato almost, mm -hmm. and you can cook it. We actually just throw a tiny bit of taco seasoning on it, put it in the air fryer, and put it in tacos. You know, that's wow. the easy thing to do. But um, our garden is great. It's been kind of wintry weather here in Hawaii, which but for us is cold, but um, we get a lot of rain, no snow, obviously. And our kale and our cruciferous vegetables are just going off right now. And in the mm. summer, they're kind of a lot more slower growing. But um, so we're having huge salads every night just with all our mustard greens and kale and arugula. And wow. It's wonderful. Yes. I mean, kale grows very well here in Colorado. <laughs> I bet. I it's bet. Like, can't make it stop. It's almost like a weed all, all year, actually. Um, as far as, you know, when you think about, you said your Dutch origin, so you were actually born 
in yes, was it Holland? Yes, I'm still a Dutch citizen, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, and now your family, and they moved here. How have they reacted? Have they anyone taken on a plant-based diet? Or? That's a great question. And then I want to back up too, um, for your knowledge. So Holland, when people say Holland, yeah, and they're talking about the country of the Netherlands, it's kind of geographically incorrect. Oh, okay. Um, Please so, tell me, because I was yeah. like, I wasn't quite sure what what Dutch meant exactly. Yeah. So Dutch means the Netherlands. Netherlands. Um, Holland is actually like a province of the Netherlands. So oh, if you okay. were to say Holland, it would be like calling all Americans Yankees, you know, or something oh, like that. You. Like it's, it's one little portion, but it, it doesn't offend Neth- me or anybody. No. Like well, it's good. It's good to know, but I didn't, wasn't really sure. Because when you think of people always say Dutch, they always refer to Holland. And so yes. makes sense. Yeah, Perfect. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. So um, tell me about your family. My family. A lot of, there's a lot of people in your family. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I'm one of eight children, um, same two parents, same mother and father. And um, I was so lucky to grow up in a household where we ate healthy. Um, The first few years of my life, my parents were actually macrobiotic. So Mm. they're completely eating um, brown rice and seaweed and all that delicious stuff. And then growing up, yes, they, we were eating everything, but it was all, you know, more whole foods, not processed foods. I, mm. I can actually recall the very first candy bar I'd ever eaten that I had mm. to sneak away and eat, you know, without my parents seeing me. So I, I'm lucky in that regard. I'm really lucky. Um, as of now, yes, I've had a couple of my sisters um, explore being plant-based. It's always very transiently. You have to remember they live in Montana. Montana is very uh, meat centric place. It, it's right. and, and times are changing, right? But it's definitely right. one of those places where it could be more difficult to um, live that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one sister that lives in Dubai, and she is pretty much exclusively plant based. So that's wow. awesome. Russell's parents have completely made the switch, and the stuff that they're telling us just how their health has improved is phenomenal. Mm. Um, and my mom, I think my whole life, she's, she's pretty much vegan. She'll have maybe fish once a month, if that, but she's very health conscious. Wow. Very good. And so as far as neighbors and stuff, so you have friends and stuff. So we had a dinner with some of your friends. Can you tell us a little bit about the community in Hawaii? Cause you're on an Island and I'm just curious how you guys meet and like, what are the availability of plant-based foods in Hawaii? Because I know we are on Oahu it's less to choose from than I would expect than even on on Maui is much better actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's funny because you think Hawaii, oh, there's going to be so many open-minded people and all these options. And um, actually there's a lot of places that it's very hard to find something that is healthy plant-based. You know, you can definitely go somewhere and I don't know, have, have a very greasy, vegetable and rice meal if you want. Um, Hawaii, I would say typically is a lot of rice, a lot of white rice. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of spam is one of the traditional things that is being eaten here. Mm. As far as community and plant-based food, yes, you're right. Maui has a lot of options. They have Mm -hmm. very good restaurants, which are wonderful. You kind of have, as in anywhere, you just have to pick your friends, find your people, find your tribe and really build that. And that's so important. So we, we try to foster that. We, even though we don't even have a completed house, you know, we still have, we've had potlucks, we've had just dinners with the majority of our friends coming over. And, you know, even if they are not completely plant-based, they will come over and bring something plant-based because they know that's how we eat. And that's, it's fun. It's fun to build that community. Awesome. So as far as you see yourself, you're still practicing a surgeon. Is there, do you have maybe a vision or a dream or a, something you'd like to see happen in your practice or in your community that you are kind of working towards Because you're speaking and you're doing your YouTube channel, you're doing interviews. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe some thoughts there? Yes, I can. I think for me, really trying to just get the word out in as many different venues as I can, you know, whether it's with my patients, with my colleagues, um, online, via the YouTube presence, Instagram, etc. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I always joke that as a surgeon, I'd like to put myself out of business, just try to really not have my services be necessary. Um, I am a 
little bit of a pessimist. I think there will always be a role for me, but if I can minimize um, the things that are avoidable, right, then that's huge. So luckily, um, you know, we can change a lot of that. And if that were to happen, I could spend more time on the lifestyle medicine side of things. I ideally in the future, I would like to change my practice a bit such that I have more time. I think the big, the biggest downfall of what I'm doing is that I don't have enough time to sit with patients and really go over the nitty gritty and the details. It's a, it's a handout. It's a, here's a referral to lifestyle medicine. We have a wonderful lifestyle medicine program here, but I would like to personally spend a little more time. Wow. So tell me about the lifestyle medicine program. What, what does that exactly entail? Yeah. So Kaiser in general, um, we have lifestyle medicine. We have a program in particular called HALT. So H-A-L-T, it's um, Health Achieved Through Lifestyle Transformation. And it's a program where you can sign up. You, of course, you meet requirements like um, you know, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, that type of thing. But if you have those conditions, it will all be covered. And it's essentially minimum 20 week program where we do education, we do cooking classes, lifestyle changes, um, follow up, of course, biometrics with blood work, weight, et cetera, and really try to salvage the health of these individuals. Um, and the beauty is it doesn't end after 20 weeks. We have refreshers, we have ongoing alumni classes, that type of thing. So that is huge. Um, we also have lifestyle coaching. So we have some wonderful health coaches here that are employed by Kaiser and all I have to do, and actually patients can self-refer even, wow. and um, you don't need to have a condition, you just can be referred. And it's again, the cooking, the food choices, exercise coaching, a lot of it's done by telephone. So you have a coach that's holding you accountable and calling mm-hmm. you all the time, making sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Nice. Um, it's, it's a great program. So I'm, I'm actually, very grateful to be in a system like I am to be able to have those resources and easily refer people to them. Yes, absolutely. Because a lot of physicians don't have the luxury of saying, hey, go see the lifestyle medicine clinic. So um, as far as, you know, let's going back to the breast cancer, are there any particular foods that you've come across in your research that maybe women or just women in general, but especially women who are higher risk or women who have had cancer and want to avoid recurrence if if at all possible. Is there anything in particular that you would say, definitely focus on certain types of foods? Yeah, definitely. So there's some really, really good evidence behind cruciferous vegetables Hmm. and breast cancer. Um, So cruciferous vegetables have a compound um, that after being processed is called sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is a huge compound. It um, has anti-cancer properties. It also has anti-inflammation properties, um, all of this stuff. And I do have a few videos on it on my YouTube channel just to refer if you want to learn more about the mechanics of it. But sulforaphane is very important. And interestingly enough, the highest concentrations of sulforaphane are found in broccoli and most notably in broccoli sprouts. So Mm -hmm. um, the broccoli is very important, but there's other cruciferous vegetables too. Arugula happens to be one, you know, that people really like to eat. So packing those in are huge. Yeah. Um, there are some other compounds that are very promising as far as breast cancer prevention and reversal. Those would be turmeric. So really trying mm. to get turmeric um, in your smoothies. Um, the turmeric, and I'm sure your listeners do know, you have to combine with black pepper to boost the absorption. Um, really make sure you do that. So turmeric, um, a compound called EGCG from green tea is also one that has shown some anti-cancer properties. So that's one that I really do try to recommend. Mm -hmm. Um, In general, a low fat diet, right? So low fat really will help. Um, The interesting thing is a lot of breast cancers, they feed off of estrogen. And estrogen in postmenopausal women happens to be coming from, a big source of it is from fat. So body Mm -hmm. fat is actually what's metabolizing that estrogen. So the less body fat you have, the better, right? Um, And then the other big, really controversial one is soy. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of oncologists and people that say don't eat soy. Um, When you have breast cancer, they're worried about estrogenic activity of soy. But the reality is the big studies, the population studies, they all show that women with breast cancer that eat soy have a lower risk of their breast cancer coming Mm -hmm. back than a higher one. So mm-hmm. soy does have phytoestrogens, but they target different receptors, different estrogen receptors than the traditional estrogen. Um, and they actually are helpful when it comes to breast cancer. So 
from soy. And uh, on that note, though, soy, um, I don't consider tofu a processed soy. I actually consider that pretty whole food, but mm -hmm. anything else. So the um, soy isolate protein, that type of stuff, stay away from that. That's not what we're talking about. Right. Just the tofu, edamame, soybeans, the whole soy, um, and then really try to get it non-GMO. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I always encourage tempeh, tofu, those type of things, mm -hmm. soybeans. Exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And as far as when you do run across, let's say, a patient who wants to make this change, what is your first words of advice? Like, how do you introduce this to someone who may be like, you're talking to me about nutrition, you're my surgeon. So yeah. <laughs> what is that introductory phrase or how do you approach it to maybe help others who want to share their knowledge? I guess I have to feel out my patients and you mm. can tell pretty easily how many of them are going to be responsive versus not. Um, I literally had this the other day, I had an obese patient in my office that had an obesity related condition and we start talking food and I very cautiously bring up, you know, vegetables, whole grains. And he starts, he goes, whoa, he puts his hand out right in front of my face. He goes, you're not going to tell me to be a vegetarian or something like that, are you? <laughs> and, you know, with that patient, what type of progress are you going to make, right? And, and you try. So then you back up and you say, okay, well, um, how about we get you to eat one more vegetable? Why don't you, can you try that? Just one more, baby steps, right? Um, right. Or instead, in this patient's case, he was having fried chicken nuggets, three meals a day, potentially, oh my right? Goodness. So in that situation, say, you know, maybe for one meal, just for one meal, can we try not to do that and have some brown rice and, you know, a vegetable? And right. you try, you do the best you can. And you've got a whole spectrum of patients, right? So you have oh, that yeah. all the way to the, to the patients that um, are, they hear it once and they make a switch and they are totally on board and all they have to do is hear about it. And you have everybody in between. So. Right. Yes, yeah. I've, I've had both extremes, absolutely. Yeah. And you're just sitting there in amazement because sometimes you're surprised at who will actually take it on. You're just like, huh, all right. Yeah. So, and they become your so the biggest uh, supporters. <laughs> so true. That and the other so thing too that you and I know um, and we learn with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is how to do motivational interviewing. So mm -hmm. when you are working with your patients or anybody for that matter, you try to find out their why, try to find out what's important to them. And then you can spin it in a way that makes them want to do it for that reason. You know, mm -hmm. so if it's, uh, if it's a grandma who wants to see her granddaughter graduate high school or whatever it is, and you can really spin that and sell it to them and make it appealing, that's, that's how you have to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I always like to, let's work out your future right now, the current journey of the path that you're on. And then let's look at, let's, if we change just a few things that I can tell you, they have the potential to really change things and put you on this path. What would that look like? And oftentimes patients don't realize that those few little changes could really just bring a completely 180 to their life. It's really fun yeah. to see, explore potential futures or trajectories of where they're headed. So that's definitely. It. And what I also think is so cool is once they make one change and then they feel so good, it's like a positive reaction, right? Then they keep going and going and you just yeah. got to have that one change and get that positive feedback and then you're golden. Absolutely. And they bring it to their family and then there's that ripple effect and they get so excited to tell you, which is so much fun. <laughs> I know. I get that a lot from my patients and my colleagues. Like I was telling you, you'll be so proud of me because I did X, you know? <laughs> No, it is. It's, it's, it's refreshing to hear someone say, Oh, I feel so much better instead of, Oh, my blood pressure is still high. I'm having side effects of my diabetic medications. And yes, incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. So as far as, you know, we have talked about you're living in Hawaii, you're, you came from North Dakota and you're training, grew up in Montana, right? You and yes. Russ. Okay. Yeah. And then so you end up in this. Yes, please. I was going to say, um, Montana has no medical school. So it's one of the oh. few states that does not have a medical school. So every single person that wants to be a doctor that grew up in Montana has to find somewhere, you know, they get exported to figure out where they can go to medical school. So oh, luckily, wow. um, there are some reciprocal agreements, you know, with um, University of Washington in Seattle, University of North Dakota, where I went. I believe Colorado has an agreement in as well. So kind of the neighboring states are taking us orphan children in, which is good. Wow. 
Yeah. Well, so you've been in lots of different places and I'm, you probably traveled quite a bit. What are your travel tips for someone who is eating a plant-based diet or transitioning? Like, what would you typically say would be a helpful hint? Or help? I think, so when you're transitioning, I, the biggest, biggest thing is just not to be too hard on yourself. Hmm. You know, it, it's not an all or nothing. It's not from one day omnivore to vegan the next day. That's not how it goes. So if you are traveling and you're transitioning, you know, you try, you try the best you can, but don't be too hard on yourself if you slip, right? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. But for me, um, yeah, Russell and I have traveled quite a bit. We, we've traveled to Brazil where I learned in my best Portuguese to say uh, I'm a vegetarian, you know, and then they say, oh, okay, so chicken is okay. You know, like they just have no idea. And in those cases, like there were a few times I had to pick the fish out of my rice in order to eat a meal, you know, mm -hmm. those, those things happen. Right. Right. But, um, we've also traveled to places like Israel that have amazing vegan food. That's like one of the best places you can go if you're a vegan and mm -hmm. everything in between. So you, you find what works for you. If you are traveling, um, internationally, happy cow is an awesome resource. You can look up, figure out where the best places are that suit your needs. So don't mm -hmm. forget about that guy. Even in the U.S., that's a good one. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I, I feel like being plant-based is becoming so mainstream. You can mm -hmm. really find stuff. You can find stuff almost everywhere. I mean, you can totally. get a bag of apple slices at McDonald's. You got no mm -hmm. excuses. You know, <laughs> there's, there's stuff everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think any grocery store, too, I think people forget, you know, you can actually create a pretty easy meal just by walking into a grocery store without having to cook something and, you know, just go through the produce yeah. section and I think you'd be surprised. Um, but that's what we've done with traveling. And we've been in rural Africa, literally no running water, electricity and stuck to a plant-based diet for two weeks. Wow. So, wow. you know, there's tons of ways to do it. Like, you know, you just have to be creative. I do had, I did have one patient that would travel to rural China and he's like, there really is no place. Like it's really bad. Apparently, I don't know. It was really strange. It's like rural China and the China state you're thinking, but things have changed, yeah. I guess. So uh -huh. we talked about, you know, using dehydrated foods like uh, leaf side is a really good one or like camping, yeah. you know, plant-based and take those with you. They're really light, easy. You just have to add hot water. Um, so yes. those are some other options as well. By the way, a plug for that. We tried those that you gave mm -hmm. me. They're oh, delicious. Yeah. That good. leaf side is so good. I, I highly recommend it. That's actually a very good thing to do. Yeah, that's awesome because we, we had come to Hawaii for two weeks and we're like, you know, it's so expensive to eat out. So we had brought a bunch and so I was like, you know, we're just going to give these to you as our gift for inviting us over to your home and taking us hiking and yeah. um, glad you enjoyed yeah. them. They're really good. And then you speak of the broccoli sprouts. I wanted to put a plug in for this. If they go to Hamama, it's H-A-M-A, H-A-M-A, -A -A. it's like ha and mama dot com they come in these little um coconut fiber sheets and they're probably i don't know a foot by eight inches and all you have to do is they give you this little um container you fill it with water and you hold it in for like 10 seconds and it you know gets the the fiber mat wet and over the next 10 days you will grow sprouts they have kale wow. sprouts, all sorts of sprouts. And it's so easy. Like I've done this for about a year and a half, two years. And you just literally cut off what you want and throw it in a smoothie, put it in your salad, put it in a soup. Um, it's really amazing. So Hamama, and it's only, I think you get three sheets for $17 a month. And wow, you can do I've auto never ship. heard of it. I'll look yes. into that. That's I've been awesome. sprouting old school with the mason jars. The jars? You know, racks and turning them and yeah. Uh, see, I always, and I would always forget so this yeah. one is so simple, like literally after, so I think around day four, what you'll have to do is you peel off, there's, there's two layers, you'll, you'll see the little sprouts start bubbling and it kind of starts bursting the little top sheet okay. and you just peel it off and then they just grow. And if you huh. can't use them up in 10 days, you just keep adding water and they'll last for probably two weeks, just growing there. That's <laughs> the coolest thing ever. <laughs> wow. This. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. That's amazing. Yeah. And you always have ready sprouts. So there you go. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, and that is a big, important health thing too, is with sprouts, you really have to be vigilant because yeah. they do have high contamination rates. So like me, if you're sprouting in a mason jar, you have to, have to rinse it twice a day. There's no exceptions, minimum, right? Three right. times a day is even better. And that's high maintenance. Like, right. I know for us to get in the habit of making these sprouts, it, it took a while to remember to do that. And 
Um, your solution sounds wonderful, but even then, if there's any question about the sprouts, if they don't smell right, whatever it is, just right. throw them out. It's not worth it. Yeah. These yeah. are just like cutting it like from their, mm -hmm. if they were like in your garden. So it's like, yeah. you know, sprouting little herbs in your kitchen. But these are, they're amazing. <laughs> I am not, I get no, I get nothing from saying that. I just, it's just a big fan of the product. So <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out. Awesome. So I know I've kept you now for a good 44 minutes here. Is, is there any last bit of um, advice or anything you'd like to say to the audience? Bit of advice. Um, well, to your audience, those of you that are already plant strong, plant based and all about it, congratulations, keep doing it. This is a huge feat and your health, I'm sure as you already know, thanks you. Like this, this is the biggest, best thing you can do for your health. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are still feeling like you're not 100%, maybe try to tweak it a little more. Try, try to tweak what you're doing. Maybe add in a little exercise. And maybe try to see if there are ways you can continue to improve on what you're doing. Um, that would be my biggest bit of advice. And I feel like I'm always trying to figure out ways that I can improve, uh, ways that I can adapt what I'm doing and feel better. And even though I've been plant-based for 10 years now, I'm still changing it up. I'm always changing it up, seeing how I feel. Oh. Well, if all of Americans lived like you and Russell, we would be, <laughs> there'd be no stopping us from conquering everything. Just, it'd be amazing what would happen. No mm -hmm. chronic disease at all, I'm sure. We, <laughs> so. we always joke that so with our living situation, our microbiomes are spot on right now. <laughs> like we are good to go. Yes, and you have two dogs that are constantly at your yes. heels. And <laughs> yes. So They're on fine. that note, though, um, people that have dogs have healthier microbiomes. That's been shown. Oh. So get a dog, and they also help. You got to walk them, and you got it. Yes, I got a dog. Remember, how did it I go? There. Yes. I love it. her name's Daisy. And when we were there, when we were talking about like my husband wouldn't let me have one and I was yes. very sad and you guys tried <laughs> to talk to him too and everyone else. And so <laughs> we finally broke him down. All the family was here over Thanksgiving, my three kids. <laughs> I said, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's Black Friday. We don't shop or anything. Why don't we just go to the pound and play at the puppies? <laughs> and <laughs> The next day, she we found her that night. It's like, okay, we'll be back in the morning and get it all set up. And there she was. She's been with us ever since. So. Oh, she's <laughs> such a cutie, too. She's hilarious and such a sweet dog. Very sweet mm -hmm. dog. But Very yeah, good. absolutely. <laughs> well, I do want to thank you for your time on a Saturday and having to go to your office for well, one day. I'll have one. Wi-Fi at my house, and then I won't have to go to the office on a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And then maybe you could take us on a virtual tour of your place. Totally. Can do that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again. And um, everyone, I will definitely put the links to your YouTube page and awesome. everything else. Anna, you guys, she's a great resource. Um, learned a lot just from, you know, before I came to Hawaii, I knew I was going to be on your YouTube channel. I was like, oh boy, this is really cool. So I'm definitely going to refer patients there as well. So thank awesome. you again. Totally. Good, You're good. welcome. Bye, Lori.